audio. I can hear you. You're coming through. Got me. Got me. Yeah. So, Simon, how many times have you told the story about our trip to Mato Grosso, the one we did 20 years ago? Not, not just the story of the trip, but how we found the inspiration for the book The Lost World. I think many, many times it's one of those stories that I bore my school pupils with constantly, like on a weekly basis. But here's the thing. If you do a Google search on the inspiration for The Lost World, you're going to find the first thing that comes up is a reference to the Sierra Ricardo Franco, the, the place where we went. But there's no reference to us being the first people to make that connection. And I kind of think it's time we put the record straight. This is uh, 7.30 in the morning, Saturday, day before the expedition starts, hopefully. Noise of Brazilian partying. They've been going all night and they came over to sit with me, uh, gave me a beer. Everything seems fine. We've got Badu, who's a guide. We've got some porters, one of which is his son, who claims he's 25, but it looks about 18. An old black guy of sort of indeterminate age called Belmao. And everyone is falling head over the heels to help themselves. It, it almost seems to be working too well. You sort of think, oh, where's the rub? Buenos dias. Well, we're going to find out what the rub is later. But maybe, Simon, you can start off by explaining what is the Lost World and how we ended up on the edge of the Amazon. Lost World was a book by Conan Doyle, who was particularly famous at the time for writing the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. This was the story of four explorers exploring a plateau in the Amazon where they find eight men and dinosaurs. And it was a bestseller when it came out in 1912. And over the years it's been made into films and TV series. And it's never really been out of film or TV since. So our idea was to really find out what was the inspiration for this. But Conan Doyle had never been to the Amazon, right, when he wrote it. So how did he get his on the ground information? I mean, this is the sort of time of Scott and the Antarctic, and at that time, the explorers were the celebrity superheroes of the day. He was a member of the Royal Geographical Society, and he went to lectures, and he read a lot, and he, he corresponded with the explorers. Can you just sort of summarise the book? You talked about four people. Who were those four people? And what happened in the book? It's written from the point of view of Malone, who is a reporter who who tries to get the story from Professor Challenger, who's particularly irascible and competitive, and he's come back from South America. He leads an expedition which goes to sort out the ridicule that he is facing for having claimed to find dinosaurs and pterodactyls. And he takes Malone, he takes another guy called Professor Summerlee, who has gone there to verify his findings, and along for the ride is John Roxton, who's a big game hunter. OK, so now I think it's time to introduce our main protagonist, Colonel Percy Fawcett. Who was he? So he was a British army officer who was employed by the Royal Geographical Society to map the borders of Peru, Bolivia and uh, Brazil, uh, largely because of the rubber which was going out of there for the car industry. What he's really most famous for was getting lost in 1925 with his son whilst looking for a lost city. He called it Zed and now there's a Hollywood film called The Lost City of Zed. He wrote all his, um, his notes up and I suppose his other son, waiting for him to come back out of the jungle, just sat on them. But in 1953 he published them as a book called Exploration Fawcett and it's in that book that he talks about corresponding with Conan Doyle and the possibility of creatures from the dawns of man existence. And this is what he said. Above us towered the Ricardo Franco hills, flat-topped and mysterious, their flanks scarred by deep cabradas. Time in the foot of man had not touched those summits. They stood, they stood like, like a lost, lost world, world, forested to the tops, and the imagination could picture the last vestiges there of an age long vanished. Isolated from the battle, with changing conditions, monsters from the dawn of man's existence might still roam those heights unchallenged imprisoned and protected by unscalable cliffs. So thought Conan Doyle when, later in London, I spoke of these hills and showed photographs of them. He mentioned an idea for a novel on central South America and asked for information 
which I told him I should be glad to supply. The fruit of it was his Lost World in 1912, appearing as a serial in the Strand magazine and subsequently in the form of a book that achieved widespread popularity. Fawcett the Explorer was here in 1908. He was always coming up with tall stories of giant snakes and uh, bats that look like pterodactyls and things like that. In fact, in England, a lot of his stories were never really quite believed. So when he got back and spun this tall tale, Conan Doyle must surely have been interested. Three years later, The Lost World came out. So I thought, what could we do to see what the links between Fawcett's notes were and what was actually in the book? So I decided to get an expedition together. My first choice was a guy I'd been with on many trips called Julian. He couldn't make it, but I wanted a photographer, and I knew you vaguely. And there was also Derek, who was always up for a laugh, and he was a local teacher that I knew. Yeah, Derek was an ex-professional football player, wasn't he? And, and very fit and very interested in this kind of thing. <laughs> well, that helps because I figured that he would be strong enough to be able to carry the load. So let's skip forward. So you put this team together. We got all of our equipment together. We flew out to Cuiaba and then took a bus over to Villa Bella where we were going to stage the expedition from. We went around the supermarkets. We bought the machetes and the food and we tested the gun that we bought out. And then it was time to go and visit the local mayor because there was a key question that we needed to check before we set off. Do people here know about the lost world and Colonel Fawcett? Aqui na região muito pouco. Nós temos o conhecimento do livro O Mundo Perdido do Coronel Fawcett que inclusive inspirou o filme Jurassic Park e outros filmes desse gênero. É, mas é, a nível de universidade yeah, é, do, e para nós é uma grande surpresa vocês a primeira equipe que yeah. que faz essa so pesquisa the first people to come here and, and a primeira look. equipe que, que vem e que vai fazer essa trilha do, do coronel Fawcett and on, on this lost world what is there é ainda um, um mundo relativamente é, virgem sem exploração sem a presença do homem Então vocês vão encontrar um mundo é, praticamente do mesmo jeito que o Coronel Fausto encontrou yeah. quando passou. So it's so it's, it's untouched there. It's still it's still virgin é, there. Virgin. So as it turned out, uh, Dr. Andre, the local mayor, was also the local doctor in Villa Bella, and he was a little bit worried about poisonous snakes in the area, and sent us off to the local clinic to try and get some antidotes. It was uh, the middle of the night, as far as I remember. There was a jeep put on for us and we knocked up on some nurse's or doctor's door in the middle of the night. She took us down to the clinic. She got us bags and bags of saline, anti-venin, showed us how to put cannulas into the arm. It was about a rucksack full. And then I read the instructions and it said, uh, they need to be refrigerated. And the guide Badu produced this. And this, this says, se specifico pessoa contra veneno de cobra. And it's basically the local hooch which they use. I personally don't think it works, but it just got everyone off our backs and let us finally start the trip. Behind me, there's a rock pinnacle. This is just mm. what force it had, he couldn't get out. But the rock pinnacle is somewhat like in the Lost World because the way they get on to the Lost World plateau is by climbing pinnacle. Um, this isn't that high, but I'm sure we will find others like it. But hang on, Simon. Fawcett went up the Verde first. So he went up the river first and then he climbed up the Sierra Ricardo Franco, uh, as did the expedition team when they went in the book The Lost World and, and their map is quite similar to Fawcett's route. But we went the opposite way. In 1908, Fawcett set off from the Rio Guapore and took um, canoes to go up 15 rapids because he recorded that very, very assiduously. Uh, and at that point, the river was too shallow, too fast moving. So they set off across the plateau itself there was no food, uh, there were starvation rations, and one of the porters, in fact, sat down and said, I prefer to die here, it's not worth going on. Fawcett jabbed him in the ribs with a knife. Later on, there was a lucky shot. Fawcett managed to get a, a deer at phenomenal distance, and that fed them, got them a up, and they got all the way across to Villa Bella. 
So basically our route was the opposite of faucets. Uh, we were to climb up to the plateau and at that point we were then going to use the canoes to go back down the Verde and down to the Guapore. And I remember the climb being really quite difficult but when we got to the top the view was quite jaw-dropping. Take your breath away, that's what people say about scenery and this, this one really did. We've gone through the jungle, we got blocked by a set of cliffs and we had to just go along the bottom of the cliffs going up and down, up and down and we started various rock falls. It just all gave away on me. Then we found a cut in the cliffs, went up, carried on up through rain for us, getting dry and dry and dry and now we've just gone at the last sort of rocky scrubby bit and we've hit the first section of the top and wow. We're in scrub savanna, Sejado, closed is what they call it here, but it's just magnificent. It's just, just like Fawcett described, just like the Lost World, with rock pinnacles, grassland and scrub at the top, rainforest on the way up, I'm, what can I say? When Forza got lost in the Rio Verde, he talked about swarms of red biting bees. We're just coming across so much, which is in both the Lost World and, Rio, and the Rio Verde trip where Forza got lost. The similarities are just coming together now. And this was our prime goal, to look at similarities on the ground, the things that we found that Fawcett might have described to Conan Doyle that then appear in the book the lost world and we kind of tick them off as we found different things but I want to bring up at this point the elephant in the room. Soon after the book was written and in fact the movie came out in 1925 about the same time that Fawcett went missing there are starting to be mentions of this book being influenced not by this region that we're in in the Sierra Ricardo Franco but in fact uh, another region in northern Brazil, where it borders with Venezuela and Guiana, a place called Mount Roraima. Yes, there was an explorer called Im Thurman. He climbed Roraima in 1884. But those a member of the Royal Geographical Society, Conan Doyle wouldn't have seen his talk because he was in Hampshire as a sort of junior doctor then, although he undoubtedly read his book. Now, I've been to the top of Roraima, and the look of Roraima is the lost world, I'll admit that, but the top of it is desolate, it is rain-swept and rocky, it's not the sort of place where dinosaur and ape men are going to live. And that's one of the reasons we went to Cerro Ricardo Franco, because Fawcett's descriptions are much, much more similar. And, and let's talk about uh, some of that thick jungle that we went through, because I want to move now to day two. We got to the top we were moving through much thicker jungle from what I remember, having to, to cut our way through, sometimes not making very little progress at all. And then we came upon our first disaster. Just explain what's happened, Simon. I've left my boot close to the fire, just over the fire to dry. I thought, oh, don't be silly, but I thought I keep on going to keep on looking at it. I just forgot to look at it for a moment and the boot's burnt up. My morale is feeling kind of rock bottom. I thought I'd wake up, have dry boots, so what I did was left my boots by the fire, but the fire flared up. Um, luckily, if I'm going to look for luck, it's not burnt the sole off. I've still got the front, and I've still got the back. So today, maybe I'm going to try and make a new middle, but I don't know what from. And there's nothing that duct tape cannot fix. So we set off again on day three from that camp. Now, remember, we were intending on spending several days to walk across the top of the plateau before descending down to the Verde. And that's where, by day three, we got to the top of a waterfall, Jatiba waterfall, which, to be honest, was sweet relief after the intensity of the bamboo thickets. Little experiment here, Badu has decided to measure the height of the waterfall. So we've got all the fishing lines, tied them together, then tied them to a plastic bag filled with rocks, and lobbed it over the edge. And so far, I think they've got to about 250 metres and counting. And Badu's at the other side of the cliffs with my pair of binoculars to see when it hits the bottom. So now I think they're going to start pulling it up and check whether the measurement's right. 
the measurements we made were remarkably accurate. They've been measured since at 248 metres. And then Derek decides to take a shower under the waterfall. And I'm watching him. And he, he stands up, hits his, hits his head and virtually lurches forward. That was one heart-stopping moment. And at the top of the waterfall also, we found another clue, which involved you climbing down into a cave system that seemed to come off from the end of the waterfall. Okay. Oh, I, don't know if I, want to, I don't want to go down any further because these rocks are just balanced in here. Uh, and it goes beyond uh, the reach of my torch, which is probably about 30 feet. Um, there's a little ledge down, about 20 feet down, and then, um, then there's just blackness beyond. Um, Belmont says this goes all the way down to the bottom. In the Lost World, it's certainly through caves like this that Challenger and his party found the way out. Um, but not me. We had a half day's rest at the top of Jataba and I remember the Swifts that used to come in and make this big show at sundown before they disappeared off into the night. We took a bit of a rest and then the next day we set off on our fourth day, but that didn't turn out to be as successful as we hoped. You're in a lot of pain? It's, it'll go down. It just all the time. It'll go down. What do you mean it'll go down? A little pain will leave, but it's just the ligament that is, is weak and lacked. Hey. And I can't walk hey. on this surface. No, 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 We waited a couple of days, but oh. unfortunately oh. his ankle got no better and we had to call off the expedition as it was and make our way back down to the bottom of the falls and back out to Villa Bella. Very disappointing point in the expedition for you, eh, Simon? It was. I did at the time consider just carrying on with Belmont, one of the guides, and trying to cross to the uh, birth of the Rio Verde, just us two. Well, feeling pretty dejected at the bottom of the gorge, we found again uh, some more clues to the lost world that we hadn't expected, and it started with a swim. about the rest of them but I'm absolutely knackered uh, after a hundred yard swim through uh, through the gorge through the canyon and now we've come out into blazing sunlight it's midday uh, and more rocks more canyon I mean one of those feelings that this is one of those lost world places it reminds me of uh, there was a cartoon I watched in my childhood called Valley of the Dinosaurs where a family went into a canyon like that and they got swept down a whirlpool and um, this is this just seems one of those places Valley of the Dinosaurs just expecting you know T-Rex or a Velociraptor or something to turn up any minute, but uh, maybe a tape here, who knows. So we returned to Villa Bella, um, having failed to complete our following of uh, Fawcett's expedition, and we arrived there at the time of the local town carnival, but that also gave us another clue from the Lost World. So there's a character in the Lost World called Zambo, who is an African who helps him. He's almost their man on the ground who stays on the rock pillar and uh, takes Malone's dispatches back. And the weird thing about Villa Bella, it's an African town. It was the Festa de Conga, the Congolese festival. So when Fawcett came out of um, the jungle in 1908, there had been a plague in Villa Bella. All the white people had left, just leaving the Africans. And they have continued this African culture to this day. And we very much believe that Zamba was based on the, the sort of African Congolese characters in the town. So at that point, we still had a couple of weeks left before our flight, and Derek was feeling good enough for us to be able to think about returning. So one of the things that we really wanted to check out was this 15th rapid that Fawcett talks about that also appears as a key point within the book, The Lost World. So we packed our canoe up and we set off uh, down the Guapore to the point where it meets the Verde, going back to the point where we'd left the expedition. Yeah, 
This is probably the start of Fawcett's Poisoned Hell. It's the first rapid on the Rio Verde. We're camped here. It's an ideal camp space, a little beach on a river bend, and I'm virtually sure that Fawcett would have camped here. So you mentioned earlier, Simon, about Fawcett's exaggeration of wildlife talking about ape men and these monsters of the river. A lot of that wasn't taken that seriously, but again, something that we wanted to investigate if maybe some of that wasn't as big of an exaggeration. And one example of that was that we found ourselves in a swamp looking for giant anacondas. Fawcett had a big thing about anacondas. He talks, I think, of having shot one that was 60 foot long, and the biggest recorded is 30 foot. We met a guy earlier on the Guaporo, and this guy said that last week he'd seen an anaconda, and he said, that thick. I asked him how long, and he said, oh, I don't know, I could only see six metres of it. So maybe some of these stories about um, kind of force it finding the big anacondas are true. And one of the things that you try to do on this expedition is make things as like Fawcett's original expedition as possible. And part of that was getting a canoe that fitted both what Fawcett was using, which I think was more of a dugout canoe, but also what they used in the book The Lost World. Well, they specified they had canvas and pole construction, but these days that's updated. So it's aluminium poles and neoprene skin. canoe designed for three people plus luggage or maybe four people without luggage and we're overstressing the canoe especially as Dave and Derek are big guys and what happens is as soon as they get in the canoe tries to bend itself outwards and the plastic is actually pulling loose the aluminium poles so the canoe's trying to bend itself out flat so what we're doing is with a sort of combination of duct tape string and pieces of stick is tightening up the poles so Simon, food was a real issue for Fawcett, also appears quite a lot in the book The Lost World, and it wasn't so much of an issue for us, but we did want to try and live off the land and kind of get a sense of what Fawcett might have had to try to do while he was surviving. For the most part, that meant every afternoon when we made camp, we'd, we'd catch fish and, and eat them. But we had this rifle, and at the moment we saw a white-lipped peccary which is a bit like a wild boar. Badu was off like a shot. I think mainly he wanted to prove that he could actually fire rifles, so he, he saw a white-lipped peccary and shot it, and uh, that was very good eating. This is some of the uh, peccary that um, Badu shot yesterday. In the Lost World, Lord John Roxton shot an agouti just before they reached the plateau, and they ate it with powdered money up, much as we're doing now and suddenly a pterodactyl swooped down on them and seized it. It's at that point that all the other members of the expedition, who had been sceptical, suddenly realised that Challenger was telling the truth. And then finally we made it to the 15th rapid. This was the place where Fawcett had to ditch the canoe and start walking. But it was a key point for us because that was the point where we finished on the Verde and essentially finished our hunt for the lost world. 15th rapid on the Rio Verde must be significant in some way. Fawcett noted down 13 key points on this journey and the 15th rapid was the only rapid he noted. Now perhaps this was the point where they couldn't go any further. Certainly the 15th rapid is the biggest one. It's virtually like three waterfalls in a row. There's no way I could canoe down it and we had to carry the canoe past it. And we think that from here onwards was where Fawcett must surely have had to set out on foot and walk. The other thing is, in the Lost World, rapids play a significant part. Challenger, the professor who came back with fantastic stories about dinosaurs on the Table Mountain that no one believed, said that he had lost all his stuff on a rapid on the river journey down. Now, he was greeted with uh, derision when he came back, and even the reporter on the trip, Malone, didn't believe him until they'd actually used their canoes to get into the rapid, which they had to portage past. This is the Lost World. This is the end of the trip. We spent about four weeks going up the Rio Verde, climbing across the, uh, the top of the Cerro Ricardo Franca. And the similarities between Fawcett's descriptions from 1908 and 1909 and Conan Doyle's descriptions in the actual Lost World book are just overwhelming. And the fact that Fawcett's trip was only just a couple of years before the Lost World came out. 
Conan Doyle never actually came to South America, so he must have had some on the ground source, and it seems that he used faucets. We, um, I mean, we're, we're totally, utterly convinced of this by now. But we do feel that had Conan Doyle come, had he seen waterfalls like this and yeah, Jatama, the really big one that we passed, he would have included them because they, they make the place feel even more lost worldy. Uh, so that was that, right, Simon? Well, not quite. We were canoeing through a swamp and we had one of those Dr. Livingstone moments. We heard a motorboat and there were three guys and they said, we've come from the Diario de Mato Grosso, we've come to do your exclusive. So all the way along the trip, we had been updating a website. We had a satellite phone and it was basically, we'd been putting our coordinates and what we'd been doing. We had no idea anyone was looking at this, but apparently the Brazilian press were and they sent an expedition to look for us. So we talked to them then, we had a little photo shoot in the jungle. But then a few days later, we arrived back at Villa Bella and it was a, a press frenzy. We're back in Cuiaba uh, and uh, it's amazing what's turned out. Everyone's uh, very excited with the project and they're taking us to see the, the governor of Mato Grosso province. Uh, the story has, has made it big in this part of Brazil, certainly. Well, I'm hoping this film is going to give us a little bit of credit for what we discovered. We shall see, I guess. Well, we shall see. Um, the thing about writing any book, and I, I write books, is that you synthesise a variety of sources. And while I'm willing to say that in terms of look for a Rhema, certainly influence Conan Doyle, I think the on-the-ground stuff is from Fawcett and Sir Ricardo Franco. The, the pinnacles, the vegetation, the bamboo, the, the whole lot, really. And that, that's what I hope is recognised. So, what's next? I quite like the idea of going to Zimbabwe and looking for King Solomon's Mines by uh, H. Ryder Haggard. There we go. Oh, Dave! Hey. Hey. hey, how are you? I was going to play a trick with you because one of my colleagues the deputy Edzi and I was going to say, you sit here and you go, wow, Terry, <laughs> you've changed. <laughs> How are you doing, lad? Good, good. I don't know. Can I get you to, finish, you to face the camera? Face. You're, fa you're facing out. That's the one, yeah. Now then, lad. Let me ask you a couple of questions. As, a, as an event in your life, how, how do you kind of look back on it? It was... I think up there of all the traveling that I've done, it was probably up there as one of the most, I think, um, you know, sort of significant trips I've done in terms of an experience. Because one of the things I hadn't bargained for was the time that we were on our way out, we came across a, I can only imagine now I've been taught this for 20 odd years, an illegal logging station. And you just saw these huge, great big trees being, you know, sort of sided in half and in, half again and all that sort of stuff and then you realize when you saw the wildlife when it was you know where it should be and then you saw all these trees and you know vast areas that were just flattened you thought hang on a minute it really is a case of all that logging now is you know flattened it for, for farming and where we've just come from where we were sailing down the Rio Verde and that, and all the monkeys were coming down and the jaguars there. For me, it, it, it brought home that when they talk of habitat, that was it. You had the habitat with the wildlife and we were there, we could hear it, we could see it. And then all the stuff that on the way out, what we, we saw with the trees and all the logging and everything. Yeah. And, and that was it, the habitat's gone. So yeah, on that, on that, on that level for me, I can relate to that more on a very emotional and personal level than just open your book look at the picture or oh, watch this video somebody's taken you know i can sort of like try and put some more feeling into it so yeah it was um it was a big thing for me big thing